All right, we are live on YouTube. Antuna, what's that? I meant to see the picture. It's been cold, hasn't it? Yes, it? Just seems like all of a sudden. Tell you what, that wind last night was killing you straight to the bone. It was brutal. I was out trying to pour. Cats always fix them in warm water, especially in the morning. If I do the evening too, and I was pouring it, it was blowing sideways. <laughs> trying to. Fall. Like from Ruby, you ready to get a list of people? We got. I'll go ahead and list them. So, we got in order: Alice, David, Lauren, Jerry, and Sherry. And Linda Sloan. We was talking about Linda Terry. So, does Linda say? Does she ever get to tune in? That's what I figured. Well, that's good. And Ken and Aaron, Ruby. All right, that's all we... Ruby, they said they're getting a new bus right there. It's going to have the ramp so that it make it easier on her getting... Well, that'll be good. And they're sending somebody to pick her up. One minute. One Bible lesson. That's her. Short chapter night, 13 verses. Did your dog eat your homework? No, I left my paper at home. That's what they all say. Yeah. <laughs> and we got Larry online, Ruby. He just called me. I was looking at something. I almost forgot to call him. Thank you for... Larry. Hey Ruby, I'll check your text there. Send you in case you don't have a class tonight. Send you and Jean's listening. Did you get it, Ruby. All right. No, it's not. Hadn't had many people listen. I forget to turn on. I forget to turn it off. Ruby, is that your iPhone? Songbook. Let's see if it see if it turns on. I had to reprogram everything on it for some reason. It really, I have a little trouble with it. All right, it is six o'clock. It's good to have everyone here. Let me get the. He called me. Is it on now? I don't see any lights. Yes, there's lights. Oh, I couldn't see them. Sorry. I had to. <laughs> Alright. Hear the grinding? It's got an antenna tuner in it. It has to match. It uses a set of capacitors or plates. Who were the last people you said? The last ones were Jean. You got Larry, right? Ken and Aaron and Linda. Yes. Okay. You caught up? All right, it's good to have everyone tonight. Continue to remember our sick. Uh, Elaine told me that Jerry, her husband, does have cancer. But they said it wasn't too big, but he will have to have, you know, something done about that uh, in his colon. And they don't know if the lung is cancer yet or not, but they're, well, they're doing preventive radiation for that. Continue to remember Alice. Of course, she has her regular pains that are so miserable, but also both kidneys have kidney stones. It looks like she can't get anything done until probably into December. Um, continue to remember, of course, Lauren. Lauren's listening and recovering, and I can pray that she'll continue to. Jerry told me that Ben, of course, he's been sick, found out he had pneumonia. So, uh, and Adam had texted me. He wasn't feeling well, so said he wouldn't be here tonight okay is there anyone else we need to mention <coughs> all right let's go
go ahead and get started. I think that's everybody on the sick list. I, I haven't heard from Sharon. She did tell, you know, she said she was going to the doctor Monday, so they, they often listen without saying, so Sharon, if you're listening, maybe text how you are. Okay. Number 859. Hard to believe we're in a new month, November. Eight hundred fifty nine. What a song of delight in the city so bright will be wafted neath heaven's fair dome. How the ransom will raise happy songs in his praise when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home. Whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. As we sing here on earth, songs of sadness or mirth, there's a foretaste of rapture to come. But our joy can't compare with the glory up there when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there'll be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Having overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foam. Every heart will be lost and each face will be bright when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, whenever a sorrow will come, there be no place like home when all of God's singers get home. Number 797. And then I'll direct our minds in prayer. Number 797. Lord, we come before Thee now. At Thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit this day. Shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Shall we seek Thee, Lord, in vain? Lord, on Thee our souls depend, in compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with Thy rich grace, tune our lips to sing Thy praise. Tune our lips to sing Thy praise. In Thine own appointed way, now we seek Thee, here we stay. Lord, we know not how to go till a blessing Thou bestow till a blessing Thou bestow. Grant that all may seek and find Thee a God supremely kind. Heal the sick, the captive free. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Let us all rejoice in Thee. 
Let us pray. Our Father, as we come to Thee in prayer, we're thankful for this beautiful day that we've had, a cool day as we've entered a new month of November and getting toward winter. Very cold nights right now, but yet some warm days to come. We're thankful we can come together as the shades of evening close upon us and we can worship in a building that's warmed. It was warm before we even got here by the technology you have let us discover and create. We're thankful for such things that make our lives so much easier. And for the ones that can't be here, that they can hear us live and we can let them participate in our worship and singing and our Bible study. We pray that we'll always have the opportunity to worship freely as we do in our land because we know that a lot of places and, and other times and maybe in the future yet to come, even here, will not have the opportunity to worship as freely as we do now. We ask thee to be it those who are sick, continue to bless Alice with her pain and that the kidney stones will soon be taken care of. We're thankful that Lauren is recovering. Give her a continued recovery and that it will be as that she'll feel as though this was had never even happened, that she'll feel so good. And we pray that for the others as well, with Alice too. Be it Jerry Reynolds as he does uh, will need some treatment for cancer. We pray that it'll be easy and uh, be totally taken care of. Be it Rick and his kidney and heart failure, bless him. And Sharon has been sick, and others maybe even unbeknownst to us. We pray that you'll bless and comfort. But most of all, be it those who are spiritually sick, those who have lost their way. We pray that you will bless and comfort them. We pray that you'll give us all good measure of health. Uh, be with Ben with his pneumonia, that he will get over that as well. And we pray that we'll all have good health all of our days so that we can serve you. Be the congregation here at Mufferville that we can be a beacon of truth, that we'll delve deep into your word to see what it says we're to do, and not to listen to words of mankind, but only to your word. And also, I forgot to mention Adam, who is sick, that's not feeling well. Bless and comfort him. We pray that you'll keep us safe, give us an easy time of departure when we do leave this life, and finally save us all in heaven. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let us sing two more and then we'll have our classes. 396. Three hundred and ninety six. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. No friend like him is so high and holy. No, not one. No, not one. And yet no friend is so meek and lowly. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggle. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one. No, not one. No night so dark but his love can cheer us. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggle. He will go till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. Number 625. 
We'll sing this before our Bible classes. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea, bidding us look to realms above. While the light from the throne shines for you and me, let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. On the road to the gold burdens we must bear, but we have help from realms above. We receive courage new when we kneel in prayer. Let us listen to the call of love. Zion's call is ringing, coming from the throne above. While we hear it ringing, let us heed the call of love. I'm sorry. While we tarry below, there is work to do, and our strength cometh from above. As we labor and wait, we must all be true. Let us listen to the call of love. Science call is ringing. Coming from the throne above, while we hear it ringing, let's lead the call of love. And Ruby Stewart Franklin's listening from Dayton, Ohio. All right, let's have our classes. Lucille Kinsley, class. All right. Turn, if you will, Hebrews 8. We'll go over the lesson first, but if you want to get to turning there. All right, Hebrews 8. All right, number one, Sandy. One. Now of the things we have spoken, this is the Son. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. All right. It's not always one, though. Number two. Chris. Verse two. All right, number three, Andrew. Verse three, for every high priest or is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, wherefore it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. Number four, Kathy. It's verse five, who will serve unto the example of the shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was supposed to God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, Number five, Smith's verse seven. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Number six. I'm going to have to go on around a lane. with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. 
All right, has to be Stuart. And we got Mark and Sherry listening. Stuart? I think that's everybody. Okay, everybody back in. Three more. Lane. Verse uh, 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least of the great to the greatest. All right, number nine. Kathy. And number 10, who will it be? Chris. Verse 13, And that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Okay. Let's go over this chapter. It's only 13 verses. All right. We talked a lot last week about Melchizedek. And the old priesthood and how Jesus represents Melchizedek and I guess vice versa. And uh, that the new law and, and the sacrifices. I know this has gotten some pretty deep material. And I hope everybody got to hear it. Because he is wrapping it up here. Because just his wording. He said, now the things which we have spoken of, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And of course, he's talking about Jesus. The last verse of the previous chapter said that, uh, that the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son which is consecrated forevermore. So, and he summed it up, and I'll reread the verse. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So he's obviously referring to Jesus. He's gone into the heavens. He's seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, who would obviously be, be God. So that's where Jesus is now. And I've mentioned this verse so many times, but I think it bears repeating. Revelation 3.21 to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and am set down with my Father in his throne. So that's the closeness and the glory we'll have in heaven, that even though Jesus is seated on the right hand of God, if we overcome here, we can be seated there as well. So continuing, Jesus, it's referring to Jesus, a minister of the sanctuary. The priest of the Old Testament, they would minister. They would take care of things. They would offer the sacrifices. They would sprinkle the blood. They would, you know, cook the sacrifices because they were cooked and, you know, given to the priest. They would take care of all the things, uh, the duties and uh, things like that. Jesus is a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. The old tabernacle under the Old Testament was actually pitched you remember what it looks like? A big square walled canvas area then with a two uh, area uh, courtyard in the middle. I just want to look up the Old Testament tabernacle. And I want you to see pictures of it because I'm sure it will be drawn comparable to the way they had it. And this is it. That's pretty good drawing. And uh, it looks like a real picture of it, the way they've got it. But this is the way it was done. You had the, the brazen altar, the brazen laver. You had a holy place, the most holy place. As a matter of fact, the most holy place was so holy, only the high priest could ever enter it, not the regular priest. And how often did he enter it? Not very often. What's usually our longest period of timekeeping we do something? How often, Sandy, do you celebrate your birthday? Once a year. That's as often as they could go. Now, your family might do it quarterly for your birthday. I don't know. <laughs> but 
Normally we celebrate things, most things once a year of any significance. And that's, you know, really a good diagram the way it looked. I was trying to think, I believe Ruby, or we used to have here, seemed like a little set of the tabernacle. I like seeing all the animals here, the sacrifices. Looks like one laid out on a table. A lot to do. And so, this was a tabernacle pitched by men. They put it up, they took it down. There were specific rules in doing that. They couldn't even look in and see the furniture had to be covered. And then they would take it down. Only certain people could move it. And it had to be covered with badger skins. And uh, so, but he's a minister of the sanctuary. The sanctuary, I think we know what that it means, but it means holy, the holy place. And so he was, he's a minister of the holy place and of the true tabernacle. You know, the one that's lasting. It would be the church here of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. Men would put up this. Of course, the Lord started the tabernacle, told them what to do with a pattern. We'll see that word in this chapter. But this is the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So we have a tabernacle today, but it's the church. And just the whole, you know, uh, the, the, the law of the New Testament. But he's a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. For every high priest, now of course Jesus is our high priest, and every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices, whereof it is of necessity that this man, referring to Jesus, have somewhat also to offer. And what did he offer as his sacrifice? Himself. And as Kathy said there, that was his, he offered it, and it only had to be done once and all. Now he's our high priest, and I know you know, but who are the priests? We are. He's made us kings and priests. That's twice in Revelation. Revelation 1 6, and that's made, that's past tense. It has already done us kings and priests. And Revelation 5 10, has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. We well, may not feel like a king in the worldly sense, but we are in that we're victorious. And that the rain on the earth could even refer to the new earth of heaven here. So we are priests. Uh, I know that a lot of groups teach that priests are a class that can never marry a certain office in the church. But anyone who obeys the Lord is a priest. With Jesus being the high priest. For every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices whereof it is of necessity that this man have somewhat also to offer. For if, he were, for if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, since there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. If he were on earth, he wouldn't be a priest because we already have priests doing that under the old law. But he is left as our high priest in heaven. That law is done away with. While he was here, you know, he still had priests. Uh... So, let me read the two verses together, this one and the one following. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. The priests under the old law were looking forward. They were like a shadow of things. A shadow is like something, but not it. If you all walked in and you had a good light behind you, I could, I'm sure I could tell the difference between, say, sandy shadow and, say, Andrews, you know, that there's, and even though I never see them, I could tell a difference. And a shadow is a lot like the real thing, but it's not it. The Old Testament priesthood was a lot like the true tabernacle and real thing coming, but it wasn't it. Who served unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, thou shalt make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. So he showed him in the mountain how to make the tabernacle. And it was an example and shadow of the things to come, of the church, the priesthood which we are, the high priest of Jesus. And the sacrifices he offered once for all. And we learned last week that those sins were remembered how often that they committed. Once again, back to your birthday. Once a year, they were remembered. Your sins were just like rolled forward continually. 
and took Jesus' sacrifice to finally forgive them. It doesn't mean they were lost when they died, but in a sense, salvation, I think the best way we can probably understand our language was loaned to them ahead of time, contingent on what? Jesus dying. He had to. Because the Lord had, if you will, given them salvation, but the sacrifice had to be made. So you make it according to the pattern, but now hath he attained a more excellent ministry than that which was under the old law. By how much also he is a mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. So we have a lot of uh, superlatives here, or at least, um, you know, things that are, are greater than. He hath obtained a more excellent ministry. This is a better ministry he has. He's a mediator of a better covenant. You know, by his death, he, you know, completed this, author of our salvation, which we'll see, which was established upon better promises. Well, the promise of, you know, his eternal life, his sacrifice, the, pro the hope of heaven, is better promises. And so everything is better under the new law. For that first covenant have been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Couldn't the Lord have made the first covenant perfect? Well, it took a perfect sacrifice because it wasn't the problem with the Lord. It was because the system wasn't perfect. It was blood of bulls and goats, which we see cannot take away sins. And so it wasn't perfect. And... Uh, Uh, Hebrews uh, 10 in two weeks for it was not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin and then next week for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean uh, you know sanctify the purifying of the flesh how much more does Jesus' blood do and so they could not forgive sin so it was a fault uh, there was faults in that and it wasn't time for him to come you know, whenever you do things early sometimes, maybe a, a mother teaching a child to bake. And, you know, those first cakes that come out of the oven, they're not going to be too good. You're going to have to wait until the time is right, until there's more learning and the such like, until it's really what you want. And this covenant led up to the new. He didn't start out with the best. This was, as a matter of fact, the book of Hebrews calls the old covenant what? It's a term we don't use much anymore. Probably was used a lot back in the more 1800s has to do with education. Does anyone remember? It was a schoolmaster. I said, he, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. But after that faith has come, we're no longer under a schoolmaster. The word schoolmaster here, let me just look it up, show you what it is. A tutor, a guardian. Among the Greeks and Romans, the name was applied to trustworthy slaves who were charged with the duties of supervising the life and morals of boys belonging to the better class. They were like tutors uh, and the such like. And uh, so the old law was like a school bringing us to the new law. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And so the new covenant is the New Testament. And so there was fault. Not that the Lord, you know, it's just, it's like you cannot have a child go out in public. Why doesn't Chris have Lucille and Kinsley out working at a job at the bank? There's plenty of good jobs to be had. They're healthy. They're energetic. I've seen it. they got tons of energy. Why aren't you working out making a living? Because they're not what? What's one word you could fit in there? They're not ready was the word. I was over. They're not ready. It's going to take school. It's going to take some instruction. After high school, maybe college, then they'll be ready. And then Chris might, by the time they get 30, 40, still living with Chris and Nicole, might say, why haven't you found a job yet? Now, when they're ready, they need to move on. It's normal. They can't. There's nothing wrong with their intellect. 
but their intellect is not where it needs to be. Yet their intellect's fine for their age. It has to mature. And the old law had to mature and bring people to Christ. People weren't ready. As a matter of fact, Galatians again refers the fullness of time when it was right. Now, if they, I doubt they heard, but they go home and say, Daddy, do you want me working at the bank? <laughs> Just try to explain. Fullness of time. Oh. I don't have on my glasses here. But when the, I misspell fullness because King James does it with one L. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son made of a woman made under the law. He didn't send Jesus until everything was ready. And we could talk about why that was, but that's another lesson perhaps uh, obviously for another time. But finding fault with them, He said, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. They're the two parts of the Israelites, but you know it all comes together now in us. Not according to the covenant I made with their fathers. The new covenant is not going to be like the old law. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. They had to be led by the hand, back to like Lucille and Kinsley here. I'm sure sometimes you had to lead them by the hand, crossing the street or something like that. They were crossing the Sinai Desert. He took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. They didn't continue, and I disregarded them, saith the Lord. That They were punished for this because of not listening. And so a new covenant was coming. This one wasn't perfect. Four more verses here. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be a God, to them a God and they shall be to me a people. So the law is more in our hearts. Then it was on table of stone. To be guilty of certain things under the old law, you had to do it. Adultery, to be, a, to be guilty of it, there had to be physical acts involved. Not under the new law. You can commit adultery with your mind. And so the law is in our hearts. It's a law of attitude, whereas the old law is more of a law of action. But he's going to write in their hearts. Matter of fact, Ezekiel said, I'll give them a new heart. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. This verse here, now you might be a little confused when you first read it. And they shall not teach. Talk about those under the new law, and that would be us. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Upon first glance, it might be a little puzzling, saying you won't be teaching people because everybody's going to know me. Well, obviously a lot of people out on the streets... I think about the east and west coast so far from the Lord and not just the coast but people are just living their lives and certainly not for the Lord so what could he mean here well I think two words here Ruby and I were talking about this verse before services we get here pretty early we got here about probably 17 18 after 5 I met Taylor the other day saying he said were y'all going to church I said yeah he said what do you do when you get there so early I said I meditate I go over the lesson. Think about it. And so, he said, yeah, well, he said, that makes sense. But, look at two words here. Every, no, every man shall not teach his neighbor and his brother. Those closest to us are going to be knowing the Lord and the law. It's going to be commonly known among us. And there's going to be people, obviously, we need to teach. But I think, you know, with the prevalence of the Word being available in print, electronic, and we've worshipped all of our lives, that we don't have to teach our neighbor. There, especially when there weren't copies of the law, people didn't know, and people had to tell. But we still obviously teach people, but it's going to be more commonly known under the new law. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That's a verse of hope. The Lord will be merciful to our unrighteousness. And their sins and iniquities will I remember 
no more. Now, we can't continue in sin, but whenever we do repent and ask the Lord to forgive us, we have to be in the Lord, but He will remember them no more. And I'll look at the last verse that we can discuss a little. In that He said, The new covenant He hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. We tend to throw away things when they get old and really can't be used anymore. Ruby and I really are going through a lot of things because we know we're getting older. We don't have any children. Someone will come in and go through our stuff and <laughs> try to make it a little easier on them now. But uh, just things we don't need anymore. Uh, you know, there's no use keeping it around. Things get old and wax away. W Ruby and I are definitely not pack rats. We really get rid of stuff and because there's no use keeping it because I know in 30 years I won't need it, so I might as well throw it away now. But it also applied to the old law. That which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. You have clothes that you don't wear anymore because they simply aren't good enough. Things get old. You just, they, they can't, they're, they're ready to move to something new. And that was way with the law. Okay, are there any questions or comments? Got a few minutes yet. I'll pass the lessons here in a moment. But I like this phrase, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Whenever I read this, there's a couple of other passages I think of where you will cast their sins behind my back. Uh, Isaiah 38, For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. I think about that often. Because whenever you think about what the Lord is, He said He fills heaven and earth. He's infinitely big. And He also is from everlasting to everlasting. Infinitely big. Physically, if you will, and time. And can you imagine casting something behind His back? It could never be seen again because He fills heaven and earth. And also I will drown sins into the depths of the sea. Uh, I looked up a few too many things here. Oh, pardon me there. Well, I looked up too much. Sins to see. He will turn again. He will compa have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities and that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. You're not going to find anything once it's tossed into the sea. I mean, though this technically isn't impossible, it's not likely. And so, back to this. Who will remember, you know, their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And that's a, as a matter of fact, this does tie in to the previous verse. Because they, if you go to last week's chapter, uh, I'll just look up. If I look up the word year, it's too many, but I want to find it in Hebrews. Uh, they went in once a year where that they had to offer. And uh, I'm trying to think. I wanted to see what else. But it talks about remembering their sins uh, once a year. 10.3 In those sacrifices under the old law, there's a remembrance again made of sins every year. I'll try to pick on someone besides Sandy tonight. But let's, let's do Elaine. Maybe she's done something wrong in her life. And what if every year your family got together and said, we want to bring up everything you've ever done wrong or said unkind. Well, that, that would be weighty for any of us. Every year, every sin that you've done is brought back up. Look how good the new law is. Their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. It's gone. It's forgotten. That's a comforting thought, and I'll probably use that for the invitation tonight. All right, are there any questions or comments? You know, when you do the cast it to the bottom of the sea, uh, I think uh, the statistic is like we've explored most of the world, but as far as the sea goes, we've only explored like 3% the ocean or something like that. It's a very small. Number. You know, it amazes me how many new animals they find in the sea. As a matter of fact, I saw something as recently as a while ago sitting here. 
I don't know if I can find it again. I was just, before we got started, I was doing a quick uh, glance through YouTube, and it flashed up about a new sea creature that has been found. And I don't see it now. I didn't save it or mark it. But uh, you're right. Cat, most of the sea has not been explored so much. Uh, newest discovered sea animal. That was in August. But I saw one today. All these things are discovered lately. I think that's the one I saw today. And like giant squid were just a myth as well. Like you think like the writing of it from the 18th century, but it was not officially discovered. It was not proved. Uh, until recently, you know. And like 2010 or something like that, or 12, that they washed up on the shore. We saw it the first time. Uh, I wish I could find that one that I saw on YouTube while ago, but that's okay. It just makes a point uh, that all these things are still discovered, and we still will. Animals they thought that were extinct, and uh, all right, but that's a good point. You look at how big the sea is. Uh, I think we all know the sea covers, we got a couple of minutes, so I'm letting her finish up. The sea covers approximately 75% of the earth. It's actually a little bit more uh, how much of earth is water. It says 71% there. Well, let's just say three quarters. Uh, it's a lot of gallons. <laughs> but take a look here back on our website. You know, a lot of land mass there, Russia, Asia, and all, well, sorry about that, but you get over here, the Pacific Ocean, uh, sorry, I cannot get it to hold still, all right. You can almost pivot the earth in such a way you can't see anything but water. But Hawaii, I don't see how they ever, ever discovered it out there. They did though. Then Antarctica on the very bottom. Of course, Antarctica is land. This is, you know, Antarctica has earth, rocks, land. The North Pole does not. I, I mean, y'all probably know this. I'm sorry, it just keeps me. But if you look at the North Pole, there is no land. They're not showing ice here. Do you think that there is no land at the North Pole? It's solid because it's frozen. But. I wonder if this verse we have on our website. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place. The north is empty. There's nothing there except water. Could be some of the sky. Could be something water. And hangeth the earth upon nothing. Just hangs there. But, uh, of course, the North Pole has no land. South Pole does. We've discovered most. But the sea is just so daunt. Look at the Indian Ocean, too. It's really big. All right, let me go knock on their door. I'll just leave the Pacific there for you to think about. It's massive. Why don't you have a job? Sorry. That's your class log up. You know, the Lord created everything just right. You know, if you look at the earth here, Obviously, the southern hemisphere has far more water than the north. That keeps everything temperate. Because in the summer, the way the earth tilts, say, you know, in July, we're actually further from the sun. But we're facing the sun. And uh, so since we're further in July, and it's tilted where we're facing the sun, that's why we have summer, that it keeps us cooler. And they have more water to bring in warmth and it works the other way in the winter because uh, the, the oceans bring warmer temperatures you know to the to the northern part it keeps everything it's it's like central heat and air the oceans are you know there's a place not to get too far if you look at scotland scotland is pretty far north here's scotland if you drew a line i mean it's almost close to greenland but do you know in scotland there's a place with tropical 
trees and flowers naturally grow. Uh, tropical plants in Scotland. There's quite a few. And uh, the reason that they are, why do you think? Well, of course, I've already given you the answer. It's the ocean. And it's because of the uh, currents. The, they come up from the middle part of the earth, hit toward the U.S., and turn and go right into Scotland, that area, and keep it very warm. And that's why there's tropical plants. But, you know, the person who discovered ocean currents and all that, he got it from the Bible because of a phrase he had read. Psalm 8. The fowl of the air and the fish of the sea and whatsoever passeth through the paths of the sea. He read that and got to thinking about that the sea had regular paths and highways, which we call currents. So, if you remember that place in Scotland that has the tropical plants we were discussing. I didn't want to get too far off with some fascinating things here. The Lord had made all this and it's, it's no accident. It didn't just happen. He designed it. All right. Let's go back to Hebrews 8, 12. Well, so you need a song. I did pass the lesson, didn't I? Number 911. Right. I think it's more along the lines of you won't have to because the Lord the word of the Lord is going to be so widespread that if you know it, then surely your brother and your neighbors also have the same exact opportunity. I think that's exactly right. And as a matter of fact, I looked up some translations of this and some of them actually said that. It was Chris, that they actually said you won't but it won't be necessary to teach every man his neighbor. The word is so spread. That doesn't mean we don't talk and try to be good examples. But the word is everywhere, certainly. Uh, now it has gone. As a matter of fact, we're told that they had taken the gospel to every creature. I think that's where it's worded. Uh, the gospel, this is in Colossians, says, which you have heard, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. So by the time Colossians was written, the gospel had gone to every person. Everyone. Had there already been people settled in North America? Very possibly. I know the Indian mounds down in West Tennessee near Freed Hardeman, they date back to 190 or so. People were here early. They went out and preached the gospel. One person told another and then it spread like that. But we're told it had gone to every creature. And so... That is, and that's a good th point to make, Chris, that you won't have to because it's gone everywhere. It's not that we don't teach others, but the Word's gotten around. The verse I want to look at for our invitation, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's a very comforting thought. We wouldn't want everything we'd ever done brought up to us by our family. There are certain things I know all of us would rather just forget. The Lord's made memories in us. And it's good that if some things are just better left unspoken. But he said, I won't remember them anymore. He puts them away. Whenever we are forgiven, it's really as though we had never committed them. And that is a wonderful thought. But you have to be in the Lord for that. You certainly have to believe on the Lord and turn from your sins and repentance. You confess His name. Baptism washes away your sins. But where we do sin, we ask the Lord to forgive us. I know it's hard not to sometimes ask the Lord to, more than once to forgive you. Maybe twice or thrice. And I almost can picture, though we're not told this, I can almost picture the second time we ask the Lord to forgive us of something. For what? What sin? Because He said He wouldn't remember them no more. Remembrance here probably doesn't mean that he doesn't have a cognitive recollection. I think he does because Peter was forgiven, but his sins were remembered to the point they were written down for us to read about. But to remember is to hold against. But I know all the adults here are members of the Lord's body, but that's how we're going to get to heaven. 
because our sins are not remembered anymore. If you're online and need to respond or hear, consider doing so as we sing the first verse of 9-11. Bring Christ your broken life, so marred by sin, He will create a new, make whole again. Your empty, wasted year, He will restore. And your iniquity remember no more. Turn to number 808. Let's sing the last verse and we'll ask Chris to dismiss us. Don't forget our services Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. It'll be our first Lord's Day of November. Hard to believe that we only have one more full month of the year left. And that'd be December. Anything else to announce? All right, the fourth verse of 808, and Chris will dismiss us. Hold thou thy cross be for my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the sky. Morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life in death, O Lord, abide with me. Yeah.